Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Moro EU and other third parties. If you prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guests are Ming Huan Chu, a violinist and head of strings at the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University, and Winston Choi, a pianist and head of the piano program at the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. Together, Ming Huan and Winston perform as the duo Diorama. We are also joined by Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Ming Huan, Winston, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. So, Ming Huan, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, how eventually you met Winston Choi. Well, um, I was born in Beijing, China, and um, I studied violin when I was five years old. Um, and I came to US when I was 15 years old to um, a music school called Interlochen Arts Academy up in Michigan. So, um, and I studied there um, under Julia Bushkova for three years. And after that went to different schools for college, including Curtis Institute of Music and Oberlin. And eventually I went to Northwestern for my master's. And that's where I actually met Winston and he was getting his doctorate and uh, so um was actually through my violin teacher mrs almeida bemos and she, uh, he used to play um for her studio and so she sort of match made us and said hey you should play with winston and uh, he's a good pianist and he is also very nice and very cute so um <laughs> the rest was history and so we actually started um uh, working together playing together first and of course, there's always a disagreement between us when we actually started dating. So he thought we dated earlier than I thought. And uh, but um, we always um, worked really well together. Um, and so, um, yeah, and since then, we've um, moved to many different places and um, um, finally settled back in Chicago um, and we are living here in downtown Chicago and with our nine-year-old twins um, Lily and Ethan um, they are actually upstairs just like everybody else we're all quarantined still so they are still home um, with our puppy Rolly. Okay Winston can you tell us a little bit about yourself and eventually how you met Ming Huang? Sure I'm originally from Toronto Canada and uh, I started the piano at the age of six. And it's, it's always something that I, I felt like was going to be my, my life's path and my life journey. And so I was um, very lucky to be able to go to Indiana University where I, I attended for my undergrad and my master's degrees. Uh, I studied with Menachem Pressler while I was there. And uh, my next, school was Northwestern University, where I worked with Ursula Oppens. And during this time, um, as Ming Huan mentioned, that's where we met. And and it was very much to do with, um, we, we started dating, but we started playing together. That was um, from the very beginning. And we're very compatible in that way as well. And we felt like we were a, a musical match and we had many different ideas that we could bounce off of each other. And we, and we stretched each other and we learned so much repertoire together. And that I think was a big part of, of the fun from the beginning is that we, we started um, learning the great standard works, but at the same time, um, we had this opportunity to, to add 
to the repertoire and have composers work um, with us and write music for us. So that was a big part of our um, initial first few months of, of dating is that we were, we were chewing through these new pieces together and, and kind of um, learning them and, and, and uh, from a different context altogether. Yeah, okay. I would say commissioning composers is still, you know, remained for the rest of our musical journey and we're still passionate about it. Okay, so uh, many couples, maybe they play cards together or they like to go hiking or maybe even tennis, but you two are playing uh, as a duo, duo diorama. Tell us a little bit about that, Ming Huan. And uh, as you're mentioning about the composers, tell us about if you would explain to somebody on the street who doesn't uh, know any couples who are a duo married, you know, what, what du dia, duo diorama is? Well, um since in northwestern years and at the beginning we were just playing and studying as students and later on we became more uh, serious um became um, young professionals and we kept our duel going um as winston said we um you know play a lot of standard repertoire you know that including beethoven sonatas brahms brahms and frank and all the the amazing amazing um repertoire we already have for this combination and we're very lucky and um so but at the same time, you know, we are passionate about commissioning new music and uh, that too, I would say, because um, Winston, since you were little, very young as six year old, you're passionate about composing as well. So, so that's become a part of the extension of his, his passion that, you know, he never became a, a, a composer professionally. He still composes once in a while, but working with other composers and uh, just fulfill that that um, passion. Um, but for as a violinist, and same thing, you know, I I have grown up, you know, playing all the standard repertoire. But there's also part of me wanting to do new music because that's something that it has been recorded for the hundredth times, and so it leaves a lot of interpretation for us. And so I think it's you know learning the great um, traditional classic repertoire as well as discovering new music really keep our duel going you know we um we just generally have a really good i would say chemistry when we work together um not so much in the kitchen though we will fight in the kitchen you know we will fight you know when we cook but when we play music we're actually doing pretty well in general would you say yes absolutely <laughs> that's um that synergy i think we kind of find a way to, um, you'll see, you'll see later on when we talk a little bit about our rehearsal process, but we, we find a way to be very efficient, I think, because we understand each other and we, we approach things from two different sides. So there's not necessarily that kind of typical butting of heads or need to break every moment down. A lot of it can just happen because we understand each other. Yeah, I would say a lot of things will flow pretty organically and people know us would know um, as musicians as who we are as people we're actually very different personality. Um, but um, that I would say, you know, also mix very well in the rehearsals because we each of us were bringing something different. Uh, Winston, I just uh, before we go on to our first uh, example, I'd like to ask you tell us about these fights in the kitchen. <laughs> I think um, it's kitchen is a metaphor for other kinds of, you know, the, the daily things that we go through in life where coming from different kinds of backgrounds and different perspectives, we might have these moments where we look at each other and think, really, that's how you think? And this is how I think. And, and but I think when it comes to music, there is less of that. And even though we might have different viewpoints, I think something about, um, you know, interpretation encourages one to grow and to kind of change and react in those moments. And there will certainly be times musically where uh, both of us want to really hold on to our positions. But with time, we realize that those positions, um, it's just little details and they end up kind of um, absorbing and, and, and kind of fitting in with one another. Um, I think that might happen sometimes in the kitchen as well, although it, it becomes maybe sometimes more pronounced because you know, it's it's not our. This is it's not the thing that we spend most of our time developing the certain vocabulary refining. So when we come to musical rehearsals, I think we can be very efficient because we're so used to talking about it and breaking things down and sharing our ideas. In the kitchen, it's you know, we're yeah. learning. We're still learning in the kitchen. Yes. Fantastic. So 
Here is our first example. This is contemporary music that was commissioned by Dio du uh, Duo Diorama. And this is Igor Santos as light becomes form. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about this as light becomes form and what it was like to put it together and what this music means to you. Well, um, this um, piece was written a couple of years ago by our friend Igor Santos and who um, was also located in, in Chicago and um, lived in Chicago with his family. He's originally from Brazil. Um, so he got a grant from from foundation so um, that is the, he, the piece was a result of that and so about um, the same time Winston and I we actually lived in Oak Park which is just seven miles um, west of Chicago um, with the kids and uh, in Oak Park um, it has a lot of um, wonderful historical landmarks um, especially from the architecture um, Frank Lloyd Wright so um, Unity Temple, where um, the piece was just performed in that video, um, was um, it, it, the piece was inspired by that space, actually. Winston and I, we started uh, a chamber music series in the temple um, a couple of years ago. Um, so it is a gorgeous space. Um, and uh, if you have a chance and you can go online and to search for certain beautiful photos. Um, and so before the the uh, Igor started composing the piece, he actually went into the temple. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Simeon. So this is a, um, you can see the beautiful stained glass um, on the ceiling. This is the ceiling of the temple. And you can imagine, you can see there's a little bit of a light shining through. And um, uh, the temple looks, um, even though it's very clean line, um, uh, rather contemporary style but the color is so warm and uh, it creates this very warm and cozy feeling and it's a perfect chamber space actually it's space for chamber music um and you can imagine throughout the day how the light would change um in the temple so that's why um and he gave the name uh, as light becomes form 
And so Igor would sit there. Oh, yes, this is another picture of the stained glass. So all the stained glasses up in the ceiling, a little different. So there's little variations, but it's the same come from the same theme, the same color and style. Um, so Igor would come into the temple, would sit there for a few hours and get inspirations. So that's why he created that sound world um, with um, a violin that has a lot of extended technique. You probably saw me sometimes would plug behind the bridge this type of very dry pizzicatos and does not ring. It's almost like a percussion um, instrument. And I also played with a lot of a harmonic um, very airy and um, um, flowy colors. Um, so, but it's it sounds very rhapsodic, but it, actually there's a very strict pause underneath. So even though it's it's very um, a flowy, but actually it, there's also swing to the piece. So um, Winston, what what did how did you um, work out the piano part? Yeah, the piano part was um, similar. That it was um, I think very much influenced by. The, the feeling one has when one is sitting in that space. So sound as it relates specifically to, to form from a visual context. So as you sit there, you, you're drawn up and there's a lot of um, so many incredible visuals and the sound is constantly lifting up as well. So there's a feeling of a weightlessness, it floats. So the piano writing very much is, um, you know, climbing scales, climbing passages and sometimes certain kinds of techniques and touches where there's no um, depth of sound. It's just very much on the, on the surface of the keys. So I think this was um, perhaps for us our first time performing a piece of music in a space that directly inspired the composer. We like to imagine and visualize, imagine this and that composer walking through that forest or by that river. And this is an instance where we actually got to not only be in the space, but to perform it in the same space that the composer conceptualized the piece. So that was very special. Fantastic. Let's go on to our next piece. This is Jacques Leneau, La Beauté du Monde.
Okay, so uh, I had some audience comments where they thought that the, they wondered, where is the beauty in this music? Can you tell us a little bit about this music and, where, and, and how this represents the beauty of the world? That's a wonderful question. Um, first, just a, a quick um, background about the, our experience working with this composer, uh, Jacques Leno. Uh, I have a, personally a long working relationship with him, having worked with him since 2003. Um, recorded uh, three CDs of his solo piano music, as well as um, numerous concerts, a, a, a piano uh, concertino. And, and uh, Jacques wrote another duo for us, and this was the second duo that he wrote. And um, he, it's, so it's, he, he's an incredible individual, um, has wonderfully um, interesting and innovative way of looking at all things. And so the beauty of the world, what this is really referring to is that in order to withstand some of the most destructive elements in the world, um, the chaos, natural chaos, as well as what's happening, you know, between um, people, the, the devastation, um, one has to hold on to beauty, right? So this is, in a sense, describing both all of the craziness around us. And by being able to withstand that, we have a greater appreciation and a vision for what that beauty is. If things are always beautiful at the time, it doesn't have the same meaning as seeking or holding on to beauty amidst um, ugliness. So Ming Wan, so uh, do you agree with what Winston says? It could be possibly uh, like a Straussian tone poem? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that also that clip that we're showing, it's only a, a, a fragment part of that the piece. The piece actually goes about a, a one hour long. So it's really a, a life journey and um, it, it's um, challenging to play to perform to learn um, in every as aspect if technically physically emotionally um, and psychologically but at the same time is extremely satisfying um, it is a very impactful and effective piece and so um, there's definitely beautiful moments um, that was not in the clip um, that we just showed um, so and we would um, it is such a, a, a wonderful powerful piece um, we would love to perform that again at some point. So that was the premiere of the piece. Yeah. And just one quick question before we move on. And why that selection then, if it's an, an entire hour long, why make uh, such a focus on that uh, seemingly violent part for three minutes? Yes, uh, that was actually an extract from a documentary that's, um, that was made. Um, this fantastic team, uh, uh, Ludovic Long, and uh, Thierry uh, uh, Bougot, uh, they came to Chicago along with the composer and his nephew Olivier Leno to to film our performance. So this was the the extract that was used within that documentary, where um, you know there was a contrast and variety and showing different perspectives of his life influences, and so this particular um, aspect of it, I guess, served as a as its own contrast within this documentary film. Understood. Okay, so uh, next, I believe you'll be playing the Bartok Romanian dances and show us how you put them together. What a special treat. Yeah, well, um, we um, just recently uh, were playing this piece and performed in one of the uh, summer festivals and, and East Coast in Vermont um, in the States. Um, so uh, I grew up listening to this piece and fell in love with it when I was very, you know, young and probably seven years old, wanted to play it, but didn't learn it until when I was in my uh, high school, college years. Um, but Winston's going to talk a little bit first about this piece because it was originally written for solo piano and uh, transcribed into many different um, versions. And so, um, of course, we're going to play the piano and violin version. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about the, the piano version? Sure. Yeah. So originally a set of six quite short dances and uh, for solo piano. Um, they flow from one to another, so there's not a real break, especially the fifth and sixth movements, it's a taka. So they almost sound like they are part A and part B of one particular dance. And um, what is interesting is Bartok 
was not writing necessarily piano music, right? He was out in the villages and in Romania and visiting different kinds of villages and hearing different sorts of dances and tunes being played by fiddlers. And shepherd's flutes. Yeah. So in a sense, what he was doing was transcribing some of this music that he had heard in the village and putting it with his very unique and interesting take on harmonies, multiple keys put together. Sometimes you hear certain chords that that would certainly not have been heard in the village, but it was his, it's his um, kind of recontextualizing of the harmonies with some of those original tunes and transcribing it for piano. And now this version has then been, been transcribed in a, in a sense back to its original some of its original instrumentation mm -hmm. by the the famed um hungarian violinist and composer uh, zoltan uh, sikei and uh so it's it's really interesting he's made some edits and changes he's changed some rhythms around he's changed the length of some of the dances he's repeated things he's he's opened up the scope of it to make it bigger and grander so do you want to actually play the original version of the the beginning of the piece, like at least the first dance. Sure, I'll yeah. play the yeah. I'll play the some of the first dance, and then we'll play the first dance together in in this uh, violin piano version. How special! That's uh, what a, a special treat, as I said, to hear two musicians each at the top of their fields in violin and piano, respectively. So the first dance um, loosely translates to stick dance. And um, of course, what the, there's so many differences between our instruments, first of all, right? And mm -hmm. some of those are obvious, just the way it produces sound, how the piano does not sustain the way that the violin sustains. The piano sounds are much more this way, uh, suggestive of the stick, the, the somewhat percussive nature of the dance. And even the rhythms are different. Bartok's rhythms are written very tight. The violin transcription smooths out some of those rhythms so they're less kind of compressed so one could say that you know it's basically writing for the nature of the instrument but it's also taking some of the the elements of the hungarian or sometimes the the romanian language and and uh, having rhythmic nuances um that reflect the language <laughs> First, you know, as Winston mentioned, is the stick dance, but the first he heard this folk tune from two gypsy violinists. So um, as Winston just said, you know, the, the instruments, that's what um, we found over the years and playing with each other. Um, the, the challenge for violin and piano duels are when we match each other and when we bring, bring out the difference of the instruments um, of its own nature. So for instance, this movement, when you just heard, and we actually went on to um, doing some research um, on YouTube, we heard Bartok himself playing this piece. Um, I think it was even faster than how Winston just played. Um, it could be the old recording and, and how, you know, it, um, it, it was recorded back then, perhaps it was a little slower, we don't know, but it sounded quite fast, sounds like almost like in one. Um, ba -da -dum, ba -dee -da -dum, ba -dum, even though it is two four however in the violin version we start on g string because of the nature of string instruments we like to draw the sound so it's a lot more horizontal than less vertical so because of that the nature of the instrument want us to sing more and therefore we like to take a little bit more a broader tempo if we take the tempo too fast it's feel like something's not quite satisfying um, for instance, if I do Winston's tempo, can we just, just do that faster tempo you just played? So for some reason, I just 
feel like I, I don't have enough time, it feels like to bring out the G string richness. And so, um, and also there's certain chords we need to roll that also takes more time. Um, so uh, it just, um, so we've decided actually to take a, a more of a violin um, a, a tempo here in this um, first dance. Do you wanna try that tempo? the 16th notes um i am clipping them a little bit so they become more 32nd notes like just to keep that um a folk style because you can imagine those gypsy players are probably not counting you know with a metronome and playing exactly 16th notes they would swing and sweep a lot more so um so that's the first dance and the second dance is called a sash dance so it's basically you know when you can imagine you know um a, a, the the dancers would usually uh, wear a, a waistband or a sash when they when they play um, uh, this um, next dance. Um, so the challenge for the next dance is that how we are following each other with the rubato. So whenever we think about folk dances, it's never metronomical, you know. So there's certain freedom in how much we're taking it and how we match each other in terms of uh, the articulations as well as most importantly timing. So do you want to play a little bit? Yep. The second movement. <laughs> told that you know sometimes you know my friends will joke with us you know oh you know you're all a little bit diva like you know because you know we're always playing the melodic line as violinists so so how we grow up learning is that a pianist always will follow us their their piano you know a complement part right so a accompanist um i actually don't agree with that and I, I i feel that you know as a violinist and just now you probably feel like you know he's following me great but actually i'm following him just as much so it's really a duet it's a teamwork yeah so if i just play the way i want to play it without really you know listening to winston's part this is how it will sound like <laughs> just being a very supportive husband so now he still followed really well but uh, it's just because we know each other so well um however you know we as a violinist i always say you know it's just as much that we have to follow the piano sound as well because there's something to be said about that it's whether it's just simply following or there's a feeling like it's grounded right when it's grounded the 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 main emphasis of the dance is from the bass right so without bass there is no real dance so because it stems from the bass notes it, so when there is a kind of a synergy um, between our our rubato it feels different than just simply being free for the just to do what whatever comes your way but that's how often pianists will play this because they have everything at their disposal so they can dance as freely as they want to and there's different ways of feeling that groundedness or not you might choose to not play it with that kind of feeling like it must resonate from, from the bottom, it could just be flighty, that's okay as well. But that's some of the things that we discuss when we approach this dance. Could, could I ask, would it be possible for Winston to play a little bit of that if he doesn't, uh, if he's just playing the solo, the piano sure. solo? But the violin piano version, there's changes of register. So some of the repeats are written in to sound differently, but pianists would repeat it and maybe play it a little more differently. You know, when one can 
play around with the narrative and, and twist and turn as, as as you like. But I think um, having more color to play with two instruments and having a synergy creates a different feeling. Fantastic. So that, so the next dance, um, it's probably my favorite dance. Um, it's um, it's the harmonics on the violin uh, it's trying to imitate the sh uh, shepherd's flute. And so I actually went online to listen to the flute, the sound of the flute, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it, you can imagine it's, it's, it's a wooden flute, so it doesn't have the metallic sound, like, you know, the, uh, let's say, Chicago Symphony uh, Orchestra uh, flutist, you know, they have the bright um, ringing sound. Um, uh, these type of flutes are much more muted. Um, so, and this movement has a lot of um, Middle Eastern um, harmonies and very exotic with turns and um, um, decorated notes. And so um, it's a, a lot of fun to, to find the color. And so I'll just play a, a few bars before, in the end, we'll play through the whole piece for you. Um, I I feel very close to it, and it's um, uh, it's uh, very uh, vocal, and um, to me it's like sounds like a female singer, a folk singer, and I could hear the words, and I can make the story up, and you know, a, a fairy tale story perhaps. Um, so it is very lyrical. It's probably the most lyrical dance of the six. Um, so. Um, yeah, I'll just play the first phrase. Um, may I ask you, Ming Huan, tell us what story is going through your mind when you play that then? Something of Scheherazade story, like far away there's a princess, you know, maybe I'll tell, maybe after this um, hour I'll sit down with my twins, we'll make up exact story together. Um, there gotta be a princess and uh, maybe there's a prince and there's desert and um, um, there's colorful clothing and there is sadness and there's certainly passion later in this movement. Um, quick question, a curiosity, do they form a piano violin duo? Actually, you know, in my story, there was no piano violin duo, but now you said it, Simeon, it's probably going to be part of the story. <laughs> I hope so. I think all of us hope so. Hopefully it's going to be a happy ending too, so yes. So the last two dances are pretty self-explanatory. There's a polka dance and there's a fast dance. And so it's just big fun celebration at the end. So I'm going to maybe just play a little bit of the start of um, the dance number five. And, yeah. and then we'll play it together so you can hear how different it is because it's so much, it truly is so much fuller and richer and in some ways more true to the sounds that Bartok had heard when it's actually heard on violin or, or fiddle compared to just solo piano.
perform through the six dances now? Absolutely. Okay. So as we said, this is um, uh, Zoltan uh, Sikai's violin and piano transcription of the Romanian dances.
Ladies and gentlemen, Dio, Duo Diorama, extraordinary, bravissimi. I think it's uh, not often, if ever, we get to hear uh, such an extraordinary, extraordinary duo, violin and piano, who play together with uh, such competency, such artistry, such virtuosity. Thank you so very much. So let's um, talk a little bit about Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. Now, uh, I believe it's abundantly clear why uh, uh, Ming Huan, you are the head of strings and Winston, you're the head of the piano program. Tell us a little bit about that, Winston. Yes, we're both um, very pleased and, and, and privileged in, to, to be able to oversee these programs. Um, they have large, vibrant international populations. And uh, we see it as very much um, central to our identities as musicians, uh, to be educators and to be um, mentor-like figures to some of these students. And um, they are in, this is a very precarious place to be in, especially uh, through the pandemic. But I think with this, with the power of music and what it has to offer, and the richness that has brought us to our lives, we try to, to give that as an example of what life could be like. And, and so, we, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Please. Yeah, well, I think that we, we, we both are passionate about teaching. We love teaching, that's another passion. We have many passions. And so um, teaching, it is um, such a big part of our lives because I, we, we both feel that when we teach, we improve ourselves, you know, and uh, we learn from our students just as much as we possibly could maybe teach them. You know, it's really both ways. And so we love our students and they're, um, the school, it's, it's wonderful. And it's in downtown Chicago, it's a fabulous city. And so the, uh, the, uh, the students are from all over the world, from Asia, from Europe, and from North America, South America. Um, so they're um, very talented and, and colorful group of students. We have a little clip of um, their recently just sent, they said, hey, Miss Ming Wan, we just got an orchestra together and uh, we're playing uh, and recorded um, part of a Tchaikovsky serenade and we hope that you enjoy. It's really not part of their courses and um, requirement at all. And they're just, um, they love music. They're passionate about music. And so, um, yes, here it is. Um, this is our school. Um, and this is the group of students I was just talking about and uh, just hear a few minutes of their playing. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit also, uh, Ming Huan, you founded uh, or are uh, director or are part of the Chicago International Music Institute at Roosevelt University. Tell us a little bit about that, please. 
Yes, so Winston and I, um, we, um, it's actually extension of our program. So it's a summer program from um, uh, CCPA, Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt. So um, the program actually starting today, this evening, and it lasts for 10 days long. And we are mostly still virtual at this point. Um, um, we give lessons and uh, lots of workshops and master classes. Um, please, um, there is a web page. Uh, um, actually, uh, there's a web page and also Facebook page. Um, it's called um, Chicago International uh, Music Institute. Um, so um, please, there drop in lectures and classes and um, check them out if you're interested. Um, they're wonderful. I have a, a group of um, world class. Um, uh, faculty members and uh, we're just really feeling privileged to be working with this group of people every day. Fantastic. So I just put that in the chat room for those watching on Facebook. It is www.chicagointernationalmusicinstitute.com. It's that simple. Wonderful. So um, I, I understand that like any great piano violin duo, you're going to give us an encore. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask both of you quickly, tell us about what, what, what do you hope for your students? What do you hope when they graduate, when they, what, what is it, uh, what is your uh, ideal? Winston, maybe we start with you? Sure, that's a great question. I think um, the world of music offers um, so many different kinds of possibilities. And some of our students um, don't necessarily walk the very narrow kind of tight rope path that they might have thought a music um, career was going to look like at least 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, nowadays, there's so many more options. So what I think we hope to impart upon our students is that they learn to love music, that we awaken some of that curiosity which has fed us to this day, um, and, and that there can also be a fire that's lit within them, and that fire can then provide the spark to, to work hard, to have a certain determination and grit and perseverance through all the challenges that one is faced as a musician because there are many and it's daunting at times. So I think that for me personally, those are the two qualities that I hope the most to to um, to, to pass off to my students, that sense of curiosity and, and the fire. Ming Huang? Um, I agree every word that Winston said, and I think that it's a, always a balance, you know, because the, the music students we have, they're hoping uh, when they graduate, they become professional musicians. So there's aspect of getting jobs but at the same time. Um, I do agree with Winston that we must keep the passion going. So as educators, we have to find the unique path for, uh, for each student and help them to find their passion rather than just come out there hoping they're all going to be in, you know, in the same way, whether playing orchestra or playing. So I think there's always um, a, a combination of things. There's so many more opportunities out there now, more than ever before, in my opinion. So for us, just make sure that we nurture them and, and support their passion. Wow, inspiring. So now I believe the encore will be by the American composer William Grant Still, Summerland. <laughs>
extraordinary, bravissimi. Well, I guess there's not much more to add after that. So let's take a look at how we can stay in touch with Ming Huan and Winston. First, I'll show this is again the Chicago International Music Institute, like Ming Huan said, begins today. So it's online, so definitely check that out, Chicago International Music Institute.com. Then we have Ming Huan Shu. Here is her Roosevelt University page, and has she has uh, been gracious enough to give us her email address. So you can write to her if you are interested in, uh, in asking her questions or commenting. And then we have also Winston, the same Roosevelt University webpage, also with his email. Fantastic. So uh, thank you so very much, Ming Huan Shu and Winston Choi. Thank you so much, Simeon, for having us. We really enjoyed today's session and spending some time with everyone. Yes, thank you all for joining and thank you once again, Simeon. So let's take a look at next week. Next Wednesday, we have Arsenti Haritonov, Sicily Parnas, and Peter John, Music Entrepreneurship. The famous anecdote about the 19th century Impressionist composer Claude Debussy was that, seated at the piano in front of his Paris conservatory professor, he played a series of chords that he knew went against everything he had been taught. It asked chord progression by parallel fifths. Debussy then looked at his teacher and asked why anyone in her or his right mind would avoid playing sonorities that were so attractive to her or him. You can break the rules because you know them, Claude, was the gist of the professor's response. Similar anecdotes are sure to be told about Arsenti Karitonov, an award-winning pianist and composer, Cicely Parnas, an award-winning cellist, and Peter John, an award-winning pianist and composer. Like Debussy, the three graduated from the classical music world's top conservatories, where they were prepared for careers in a music industry of the past. The rules they had learned would not guide them even one step out of the conservatory's front door. That's when entrepreneurship comes in and the chords thicken. Come welcome Arsenti, Sicily, and Peter to our show and get ready for a redefinition of virtuosity. As always, all information about upcoming shows is available at www.simianmoro.com. Once again, thank you so very much to Ming Huan Chu and to Winston Choi. Thank you very much, uh, especially to you, our participants, for making it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, and from Chicago, Illinois, good night, goodbye, see you next Wednesday. <laughs>